The super hacker, whose name is George Hotz, has changed the world after he was the first person to hack the iPhone and the PlayStation 3. He is also the creator of self-driving car technology and was offered a job by Elon Musk himself. His elite hacking skills would lead him to trouble and would face lawsuits from major companies. He even gained the attention of the infamous hacking group, Anonymous, causing them to get involved in George Hotz's life. During the summer of 2007, Apple introduced the iPhone through an exclusive partnership with the service provider AT&T. George Hotz, a 17-year-old from Glenrock, New Jersey, was subscribed to T-Mobile. Although he desired an iPhone, he also wanted to use it without changing network providers. So what did he do? Well, he decided to become the first person to ever hack the iPhone. Every individual hack involves a fundamental challenge changing the way a device works beyond its intended design. According to Hotz, the key is to decipher how to communicate with the device and then convince it to comply with your commands. After conducting extensive research alongside other online hackers, Hotz discovered that he could trick a chip inside the iPhone into thinking it had been erased. It became as easy as talking to a baby to convince the device to follow his every instruction. He grabbed a Phillips head screwdriver to loosen the two screws securing the back of the phone. Using a guitar pick, he carefully maneuvered around the small groove and released the back with a satisfying snap. Eventually, he pinpointed his target, a square sliver of black plastic known as a baseband processor, responsible for restricting the ways the iPhone would work. To gain control over the baseband, he needed to override its commands coming from another part of the phone by soldering a wire to the chip, applying voltage, and then scrambling the code, he successfully gained command over the iPhone. On his computer, he developed a program enabling the iPhone to function on any wireless carrier. The following morning, Hot stood in his parents' kitchen with a video camera set up to record it. He spoke with a distinctive Jersey accent. Hey everyone, I'm Gio Hot. He introduced himself, referring to his online alias, then pulled out the iPhone from his pocket. He said, This is the world's first unlocked iPhone. Hotz's YouTube video gained nearly 2 million views, propelling him to the status of the world's most famous hacker at the time. The media loved the story of the teenage tech head from New Jersey who outsmarted Apple. There is no doubt that George Hotz is a tech genius, and if you'd like to learn some similar skills yourself, I recommend using Course Careers. Course Careers is perfect for anyone interested into getting into the IT industry. When compared to traditional colleges, Course Careers is a fraction of the cost and takes a fraction of the amount of time to complete. Course Careers is perfect for landing high paying jobs in the IT industry. High performing students are getting job offers through the Course Careers platform before they even apply for them. Just look at all these positive student stories. Clicking the link below will give you a free introduction course and you can sign up to find out how to start your career in the IT industry without any prior degrees or experience. Hotz, in a bold move, announced the auction of the unlocked iPhone. The highest bidder was the CEO of Certicel, a cell phone refurbishing company. The CEO won the auction with a bid of three brand new iPhones and a 2007 Nissan sports car. During an interview on CNBC, Aaron Burnett, asked whether Hotz believed the surge in Apple stock that day could be attributed in part of his actions. More people desire iPhones now if they can use them with any provider, he says. Also saying he would love to engage in a conversation with Steve Jobs about the matter. Apple and AT&T maintained silence as unlocking an iPhone was illegal, yet it raised concerns about potential piracy. Several hardware manufacturers often sell devices at a loss recouping expenses throughout monthly contracts or software sales. When questioned about the unlocked iPhone at a press conference, Steve Jobs responded with an awkward smile, stating, this is a constant cat and mouse game that we play. People will try to break in, and it's our job to keep them people from breaking in. Steve Wozniak, Apple's co-founder with a history of hacking telephone systems, extended his congratulations to HOTS via email. It was like a story out of a movie of someone who solves an incredible mystery. Wozniak said, 
I understand the mindset of a person who wants to do that, and I don't think of people like that as criminals. In fact, I think that misbehavior is a very strong correlation with the responsibility for a creative thought, he says. Hots continue to jailbreak or unlock different iPhone versions until, two years later, he shifted his focus to a new challenge, Sony, one of the world's largest entertainment companies. His target was supposedly impenetrable, the PlayStation 3 gaming console, the latest version of Sony's flagship system. On December 26, 2009, he blogged, the PS3 has been on the market for over three years now, and it is yet to be hacked. It's time for that to change. The term hacker, when used in terms of technology, at first implied student and specialist investigating machines. A hacker was also known as a trickster. In the 1970s, Wozniak constructed a framework that allowed him to make phone calls at no cost. He would make many calls. One time, he called the Vatican and was impersonating Henry Kissinger and got a bishop on the line. Over time, the term hacker took on a darker meaning. Somebody who takes your credit cards or crashes an online system. Today, there are three primary types of fundamental hackers. A white hat hacker. He strictly hacks to find vulnerabilities to improve a system. A black hat hacker. who hacks to assault, causing damage or stealing people's data with bad intentions. And a grey hat hacker who is someone in the middle. They sometimes hack with good intentions and proper authority, and sometimes hack with bad intentions for personal gain. Hotz enjoys hacking, getting inside a machine to perceive how it functions, and evolving it. In the eyes of Hotz, hacking is merely a game, playing against somebody in a powerful position. Hotz would end up writing his very first computer program when he was five, while sitting on his father's lap at the computer. By the fifth grade, he was building his own gaming consoles, using an electronic project kit he got from Radio Shack. His parents would frequently find generic household items such as TV remotes and radios destroyed. His father, a school computer teacher, said he always liked learning stuff, and if that's how he did it, great. Hotz became known at school as a creative joker who rolled down the hallways in sneakers with wheels and once hacked several classroom computers to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony at the same time. Hotz was bored with his classes and let his grades slide. George's mother, who was a social worker, says she always supported. I didn't want school to kill his passion, she says. At the time when Hotz was 14, he would beat thousands of other students from around the world to be in the finals of the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. He made a guest appearance on the Today Show with his innovation, a little robot on wheels that could determine the layout of a room, utilizing infrared sensors, and remotely transfer the data back to a computer. The interviewer asked about the technology's potential to enhance automated vacuum cleaners. Yet, Hotz was thinking the robot could assist in military operations. Before the military enters a complex, they could send it in there, he said. After this, in high school, Hotz would construct the Neuropilot, a kind of segue that could be controlled by brainwaves. Organizations have tried using a similar technology as gaming controllers, yet the technology seemed far from complete. The Neuropilot worked, however, it would be very inconsistent when transferring data from the user's mind to the inputs within the game. In 2007, Hotz built a 3D display that said, I want a holodeck inspired by Star Trek, that made him a finalist at the International Science and Engineering Fair once more. This time, he won the Electrical and Mechanical Engineering category and won $15,000. After high school, Hotz enlisted at Roach's Institute of Technology, only to drop out after a few weeks to start an internship at Google in Silicon Valley. Hotz's financial support came from donations from individuals who had downloaded programs he'd wrote and gave away for free. One of the programs being jailbreaking the iPhone 3GS. His hacks created sufficient money that he could afford to purchase an old white Mercedes. In any case, after spending a couple of months at Google, he got bored and in 2009 moved back home to New Jersey. Since he hacked the iPhone, 
geeks often send him devices to see if he could hack into them. Someone sent Hotz a PlayStation 3 by mail that year, challenging him to become the first person in the world to hack it. Hotz posted on the web that he was going to attempt to hack the PS3, then was set on finding the piece of the console that he could gain access to, to allow him full control. This piece was called the hypervisor, and that was Hotz's focus. To access the hypervisor, he needed to get on the other side of the two chips called the cell and the cell memory. He knew how he planned to scramble them by attaching a wire to the memory and shooting in surges of voltage. He used the same method to hack the iPhone. His parents frequently gave him gifts that were valuable for his leisure activities. After he hacked the iPhone, they got him a more expensive gift. For Christmas in 2009, they gave him a $350 soldering iron. Hotch removed the back of the PlayStation 3 from its case while sitting on the floor in his room. He started pulsing the chips after pressing the iron to the wire. Then he needed to write a program that would enable him to gain control over the machine. Hotz went through composing drafts of the program on his PC and individually trying them on the hypervisor. However, the first few attempts kept giving him the same error. The number five. Hotz knew this menu was unauthorized. He knew that if he had gained himself access, he would see a zero instead of a five. At last, he tried for several weeks. Hotz had made a string of code that was over 500 lines long. He ran it on the PS3 and anxiously watched the screen. A single digit was displayed on the machine. Zero. Hotz made an announcement on his blog on the 23rd of January 2010 that he had officially hacked the PS3 just over a month after he posted his challenge. He later presented a document detailing how others could do the same and published his code for free. Hotz had hacked the two of the most popular gadgets of his time. Nothing is unhackable, he told the BBC. I can now do whatever I want with the system. It's like I've gotten an awesome new power. I'm just not sure how to wield it. Sony answered by delivering an update that removed the use of other operating systems. The way that Hotz had gotten to the hypervisor, other OSs allowed the machine to run Linux. Running Linux basically diverted the PS3 from a gaming console with minimal additional functions into a fully operational computer, which individuals could use to compose programs. They were annoyed that Sony had denied them from being able to do this. On Sony's blog, a commenter wrote, I am extremely upset. Some needed to get behind HOTS. This is madness. Hackers unite. GeoHot will lead us into the light. However, many were enraged at HOTS rather than Sony. They even went as far as posting his phone number online and was receiving hate calls. HOTS would take it easy for a while after this and went to China spending the summer of 2010 biking through the country. He would return home at his parents' house later that year. Now, Hotz had returned home, and once again, in late December, Hotz chose to hack the PS3 in a manner that would give him complete control and allowed him to re-establish what Sony had eliminated. On New Year's Eve, Hotz and some mates played beer pong and watched the Times Square ball drop on television. He woke up hungover on the lounge at a friend's house. With a towel across him, he staggered back home and grabbed some food and thoroughly considered things through. He needed control of the PS3 Met Loader, a piece that worked like a master key that allowed him to open everything. Hotz knew that the Met Loader was concealed inside the PS3. However, he understood that he didn't need to find and break into where the Met Loader was stored. He could run a decoding program in a different section of the machine and cause the key to show up there. He needed to sort out some way to address the Met Loader and order it to show up. In something like 10 minutes, he had coded the PS3 hack. The cursors flickered, showing that Hotz had the ability to do anything with the PS3. He could install other operating systems, play torrented games, or run any software. He arranged a web page and a video documenting on what he had done. Yet, he would delay the launch of the page. In spite of the fact that Apple had never sued anybody for jailbreaking, Sony had responded legally to hacks of the PlayStation 3. Sony had bragged about the security of the PS3. Hotz wasn't simply changing Sony's reputation, he was possibly making the way for robbery. 
With these bad thoughts in Hotz's mind, he composed code that disabled the capacity to run illegal programs with his hack and added a note to his document. I don't condone piracy. In any case, he wanted someone else's thoughts. He asked his friends in the hacker community if he should release his hack. He signed into an online chat channel. Yes, said one of them. Information should be free. This is the battle of our age. The battle between control of data and opportunity of data. Additionally, upon the release of the hack, unknown to his parents, he had apparently taken oxycodone and other substances, would fill him with the feeling of immunity. With this feeling, he would upload the PS3 jailbreak instructions. On January 11th, 2011, only weeks after releasing the hack, Hotz was playing Age of Empires 2 on his PC in New Jersey when he got an email from Sony. The email was a lawsuit for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and facilitating copyright infringement, such as downloading pirated games. The company requested a temporary restraining order. As indicated by the Entertainment Software Association, it is estimated that piracy costs businesses $8 billion every year. Sony was also trying to destroy any gadgets that was made to help hack the PS3, and one of the online instructions removed. When the news of the lawsuit had reached the internet, nerds raced to Hotz's website, looking for the information while they still could. At Carnage Mellon College, David Toteski, a computer specialist, made duplicates of Hotz's documents. Toteski published content on a blog saying that Sony was doing something breathtakingly stupid, presumably because they didn't know any better. Free speech and free computing rights only exist for those determined to execute them. Trying to suppress these rights in the internet age is like spitting into the wind. The group called Electronic Frontier Foundation said in a statement that the Sony vs HOTS case sent a dangerous message that Sony has rights in the computer it sells you even after you buy it and therefore can decide whether you're tinkering with the computer is legal or not. The way it should be is that when you purchase a computer, it's yours. However, Sony's opinion was that Hotz's hack was also conveying a bad message. Assuming people were allowed to break into their machines, game makers would be cheated out of funds. Hackers could change games to beat anyone who played it. Riley Russell, who works for Sony Computer Entertainment of America, said, Our motivation for bringing this litigation was to protect our intellectual property and our consumers. On January 14th, Hotz went on a famous news program catered towards gamers called Attack of the Show. At the point when the host asked what he was being sued for, Hotz jokingly said, making Sony mad. Although he wasn't kidding. Afterwards, he made a rap video on YouTube, which he named the Light Up Contest. In a blue sweatshirt, he sat in front of the webcam his computer playing in the background, and he started to rap. Yo, it's Geo High. And for those that don't know, I'm getting sued by Sony. Hotz's rap gained praise in online chat rooms, but failed to do the same within the government. A district court in California approved Sony's request for a restraining order against Hotz, keeping him from hacking and spreading more details on the inner workings of any of Sony's machines. It also approved Sony's requests to subpoena information from Twitter, Google, YouTube, and Hotz's internet service provider, Bluehost. This included the internet protocol address of anyone who downloaded the instructions from his website, which further enraged supporters for digital rights. Sony had also gained access from Hotz's PayPal account. Hotz was turning into some sort of leader. One of Hotz's followers posted, Geohot equals saviour of mankind. Hotz gained the attention of many online, including a notoriously famous hacking group known as Anonymous. Anonymous is a global, decentralised and constantly evolving group. I'm sure most of you have heard of Anonymous by now. They frequently hack for what they claim to be right of free speech, free information or for the lulls. In April, a member of Anonymous started an online chat channel called Operation Sony. 
it is the duty of Anonymous to help out this young lad and to protest against Sony censorship. This was their mission statement, and members from all over the world joined the channel to discuss a plan. As the channel filled, Anon started uncovering contact details on Sony's attorneys and were discussing the best strategies. Should they stand outside Sony's stores, create flash mobs, send dark faxes which could use up all the ink in their machines? All of these thoughts came to mind. Ultimately, they chose a DDoS attack. Flooding Sony's sites with requests until the website crashed. In a press release issued on April 4th, Anonymous made their plan public with an announcement saying, Congratulations Sony, you have now received the undivided attention of Anonymous. You saw a hornet's nest and stuck your penises in it. You must face the consequences of your actions. Anonymous style. It only took hours and both Sony.com and PlayStation.com were down. Anonymous posted a video to YouTube with its request, allow PS3 modifications and drop the case against HOTS. It didn't take long for the anonymous attack to spiral out of control. One Anon was calling for individual hacks against Sony workers and the adjudicator in GeoHot's case. Other Anons posted the telephone numbers, relative names and addresses of Sony's chiefs. They even released the CEO's home address and proposed several strategies for assault. Back in the bedroom of George Hotz, he had a sense of uncertainty about Anonymous's plan. He thought to himself, I pray to God Sony doesn't think it's me. He was against online combat, and he was also against intruding someone else's property. Sony made the announcement on April 11th that it had reached a settlement with Hotz. Hotz denied wrongdoing, but agreed to never reverse engineer any Sony product in the future. Yet, Hotz's supporters felt that the settlement was a type of restriction. Some of his backers made shirts with the slogan, Free GeoHot, and others protested by going to Sony stores in cities like San Diego and Costa Mesa. Additional damage was done on Sony systems. On April 19th, 2011, at 4.15pm, technicians at Sony Network Entertainment's headquarters in San Diego observed that four of their computer servers were rebooting simultaneously without authentication. The group took the systems and disconnected them and started analysing the action logs. Their investigations revealed that the servers and possibly others had been hacked. Sony promptly shut down the PlayStation organisation. They said that it was the victim of a hacking assault that uncovered the address passwords, data births, and emails of over 77 million PlayStation Network users who pay to use their servers. There was no evidence of credit card data being stolen in the process, but there is certainly a possibility of that occurring. It was not confirmed if it was anonymous or someone else taking advantage of the situation, but it was clear that the events were linked with the GeoHot incident. Security specialists called it quite possibly one of the greatest data breaches of its time. Sony reported that it would hold the PlayStation Network down at an expected cost of $10 million in income loss each week as it tried to fix the problem. At 4.51am on April 28th, HOTS made a statement about the PlayStation Network hackers. Running homebrew and exploring security on your devices is cool. Hacking into someone else's server and stealing databases of user information is not cool. You make the hacking community look bad even if it is aimed at douches like Sony. Hotz was showing the differences between white and black hat hackers. 24 million accounts were exposed when the company discovered a data breach on the Sony Online Entertainment servers on the 1st of May. A file that had been placed on one of their servers was also discovered. It was named Anonymous and read, We are Legion. At a public interview in Tokyo that day, Kaz Haraya, the CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment, and two chief executives of Sony confronted the press group. Putting his microphone on the table, Haraya apologised, and he and the others bowed low for eight seconds while the cameras flashed. They said it'll take him a few days for network services to be back up. However, the system's full restoration took two weeks. It didn't take long before Sony had another power to battle with. A subgroup of Anonymous, known as 
Lulz Security, more commonly referred to as Lulzsec. On May 30th, they hacked the PBS website in retaliation for what they believed to be unfair coverage of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. This was not their first instance of dark comedy. They posted a made-up report revealing that the rappers Tupac and Biggie Smalls had been hanging out in New Zealand. Lulzsec hacked into Sony Pictures website on June 2nd and according to the company, stole more than a million passwords from customers who had entered personal information on the site. Sony later would change the figure to be 37,000. According to a statement, the group's goal was not to appear to be master hackers, but rather to highlight Sony's persistent security flaws. Lulzsec said that Sony was storing passwords in plain text rather than encrypting them. Furthermore, the statement advised fellow hackers to tear the living shit out of them while they can. Take everything. Lulzsec's individuals broke in utilizing a simple procedure called SQL injection, which let them have access to forbidden data on Sony Pictures' website. Black Hat hackers started posting corporate messages, and throughout the late spring of 2011, assaults on media, technology, and different foundations came practically daily. Lulzsec claimed that the summer of lulz had happened when Nintendo, Sega, EA, the News Corporation, NATO, and even the CIA were hacked, among many others. Hotz didn't intend to inspire a hacking war, but he still stands by what he did. A month after the settlement between Hotz and Sony, Hotz moved back to California to take on a job at Facebook. Eight months later, he would quit. On March 6, 2012, US authorities revealed the indictment of six highly skilled hackers associated with Anonymous and Lulzsec. A federal law enforcement official emphasized the gravity of the arrests, labeling the detained individuals as core members. Despite the fact that Hotz had never engaged with members of Lulzsec or Anonymous, even when they stuck with his cause, he remained very casual about their outcome. He declined to pass moral judgment on the indicted hackers, asserting, I'll make a technical judgment. If they were that good, they wouldn't have gotten caught. Despite the arrests, other Anonymous members wanted to persist in their campaign. Companies were also intensifying their efforts. Jim Kennedy, Senior Vice President of Strategic Communications for Sony Corporation of America, noted in an email that they had underscored the sophistication of cyber criminals. Sony responded by appointing a corporate executive to oversee global information security and privacy, promoting Nicole Seligman, previously targeted by hackers as general counsel to the position of president of the Sony Corporation of America. Kennedy acknowledged the ongoing challenge of security, stating, in the end, it must be recognized that no system is absolutely foolproof. Consistent vigilance is essential. In the previous year, 2011, engineers from Sony extended an invitation to HOTS for a meeting at the American headquarters in Foster City. Nervous yet intrigued, HOTS entered the building while casually snacking on Lucky Charms, leaving a trail of marshmallows in the lobby. Anticipating the presence of lawyers, he prepared to adopt a confrontational stance. However, to his surprise, he encountered a room full of PS3 engineers who were respectful and eager to understand more about how he had successfully breached their system. Early in the year of 2014, there was Google's hacking competition called Ponium which was focused on identifying security vulnerabilities in the Chrome operating system. The total price pool amounted to 2.7 million US dollars. The designated targets for this challenge were either the base Wi-Fi model of the ARM-based HP Chromebook 11 or the 2GB Wi-Fi equipped model of the Acer C720 Intel Chromebook, both running the latest stable version of Chrome OS. The Intel exploit earned a prize of $150,000 and it was successfully executed by George Hotz. Hotz exploited a chain six layers deep targeting the HB Chromebook 11, resulting in the implementation of a persistent program on Chrome OS. This intricate hack involved navigating through four distinct security holes, including memory corruption in Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine, command injection in Crush, Chrome's OS limited shell, a path reversal issue in cross-disk, 
the program responsible for mounting and unmounting file systems in Chrome OS. And finally, a problem related to file persistent during booting. Shortly after, Chris Evans, a Google security engineer, extended an invitation via email to HOTS. How would HOTS feel about joining an exclusive team of full-time hackers dedicated to identifying security vulnerabilities in widely used software connected to the internet? Google was set to unveil this team, named Project Zero, compromising of elite Google security researchers. Their primary mission is to seek out and neutralize security flaws presented in global software. These concealed vulnerabilities, commonly referred to as zero-day exploits, serve as targets for exploration by criminals, state-sponsored hackers, and intelligence agencies in their espionage activities. By assigning its researchers the task of bringing these vulnerabilities to light, Google aims to prompt the correction of these flaws that are conducive to spying. Notably, Project Zero's hackers will not limit their focus to Google's products alone. They will have the freedom to target any software housing zero-day vulnerabilities, demonstrating and publicizing them to compel other companies to enhance the protection of Google's users. People deserve the freedom to navigate the internet without the looming threat that vulnerabilities could compromise their privacy with a mere visit to a website, expresses Evan, a British-born researcher who previously led Google Chrome's security team and now leads Project Zero, cheekily dubbing himself on his business card as Troublemaker. Our goal is to concentrate on the source of these high-value vulnerabilities and eradicate them. Project Zero has already enlisted a formidable team of hackers from within Google, resembling a dream team in the hacking realm. Ben Hawkes, a New Zealander, gained recognition for discovering numerous bugs in software, such as Adobe Flash and Microsoft Office apps in 2013 alone. Tavis O'Mandy, an English researcher of renown, is one of the industry's most prolific bug hunters, recently focused on revealing how antivirus software can harbor zero-day flaws that compromise user security. George Hotz started by serving the team as an intern, adding an air of mystery to Google Security Group Switzerland-based Brit Iron B was credited under the Project Zero name for uncovering six bugs in Apple iOS, OS X, and Safari in the previous months. The team had plans to have over 10 full-time researchers under its management. Most of them were going to be based in an office in the Mountain View headquarters, utilizing a range of floor hunting tools, from pure hacker intuition to automated software that bombards target software with random data for extended periods to identify files causing potential dangerous crashes. During the middle of 2014, by leveraging a vulnerability in the Linux kernel, Hot successfully hacked Samsung Galaxy S5. The root exploit is based on Linux kernel, discovered by a hacker known as Pinkie Pie. This exploit capitalizes on an issue within the Vutex subsystem, facilitating privilege escalation while initially designed for the version Galaxy S5, the root exploit is expected to be compatible with virtually every device sporting an unpatched kernel. In September 2015, Hotz established his AI startup, Comma AI. During an interview with Bloomberg, Hotz disclosed that the company was developing vehicle automation technology utilizing machine learning algorithms. Hot successfully created a self-driving 2016 Acer ILX, showcasing it in a video on California's interstate freeway. Hot's aimed to sell his technology to Tesla Motors and had a meeting with the CEO, Elon Musk. According to Hot, Musk proposed a deal involving a payment of $12 million, with a deduction of $1 million for each month Hot spent on the project. The task was to develop a driving system capable of replacing the mobilized solution that Tesla was utilizing at the time. However, Musk would go on to dispute the claim. In a December 2015 interview, Musk offered advice to Hotz on his self-driving car project. George would decline Musk's offer, as he was continuously trying to change the terms and reply to Elon's email, saying, I appreciate the offer, but like I've said, I'm not looking for a job. I'll ping you when I crush Mobileye. On October 27th, 2016, the National Highway Traffic Safety Emission notified HOTS that his product needed to adhere 
to Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards as per legal requirement. The NHTSA requested information to verify compliance. Just a day later, George Hotz tweeted that the Comma 1 project was cancelled. Christian Lee noted that the NHSTA intended to initiate a conversation, but instead encountered resistance from Silicon Valley, expressing an attitude of defiance. Try to regulate us through leaders, and we'll take our ball and go home. On November 30th, 2016, Comma AI revealed through its website that it had released the software code and robotics research platform for its driver assistance systems, originally intended for commercial sale by the end of 2016. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration intervention prompted a redirection. The open source initiative now provides an avenue for Comma AI to implement its technologies without encountering regulatory hurdles. The code is accessible at no cost via the GitHub code repository. The software is compatible with specific Honda Civic and Acura car models, both of which George Hotz had previously used for testing. In addition, Hotz has shared an online tutorial for constructing the device. The device reassembles a smartphone encased in 3D printing material, designed to be mounted on the windshield. Incorporating this information, you should be equipped to reproduce and initial experiments. Hot stated in a message on the company's website. Comma AI has a data set encompassing over seven hours of highway driving, which is available for public domain. As in 2016, Hotz advised that the technology is currently in alpha quality software stage, signifying early development that may need fixes. In September, two Reuters reporters accompanied Hotz for a test drive of his driver assistance system. During the drive, the device experienced a loss of connection with the vehicle sensors responsible for detecting other cars on the road. This prompted Hotz to pull off at an exit, restart the car, and reboot the device. The test car also encountered challenges in steering itself onto freeway on-ramps, compelling Hotz to take over. Originally, Hotz had intended to sell the device on Amazon for $999 to car owners already driving a Honda Civic or Acura. However, Honda has classified that it has no association with Comma AI. The course of action shifted when Hotz received an October letter from NHTSA requiring Comma AI to substantiate the safety of its device to regulators. Additionally, Comma AI received a cease and desist letter from California's Department of Motor Vehicles. However, Hotz contended that his technology did not fall within the state's permitted requests, since it did not facilitate the cars in becoming fully automatic. On September 14th, 2018, it was announced that Hotz would resume his role of head of the research team for the project at Comber AI, and Richard Bassini was appointed as the new CEO. Although Hotz had initially left in March 2019, he returned in May to resume his position as president. On January 7th, 2020, Comma AI unveiled its Comma 2 ADAS driver assist device, priced again at $999 at the annual CES Tech Show in Las Vegas. As of October 31st, 2022, Hotz announced that he was taking a break from his involvement with Comma AI. On November 16th, 2022, Hotz decided to join Twitter after showing his support for Elon Musk's call for the company to be extremely hardcore, recently after he purchased Twitter. He resigned as a CEO of the self-driving startup. Hotz commended the attitude that fosters remarkable achievements, stating on Twitter, Let all the people who don't desire greatness leave. In response to a tweet mocking him, Hotz pledged to put my money where my mouth is by committing a 12-week internship at Twitter in San Francisco. Musk responded and said, let's talk. Just two days later, on November 18th, Hotz confirmed that he was officially working for Twitter. Hotz revealed three days later that Musk had assigned him two tasks, both to be completed within the 12-week time frame. One being fixing Twitter's search, and the other addressing the pop-up issue that might appear when scrolling through Twitter without being logged in. If you considered Hotz's employment starting from November 18th, it implies that he left Twitter approximately five and a half weeks in his originally proposed 12-week stint. Despite leaving ahead of his initial planned schedule, Hot stated 
that he's still rooting for the success of Twitter 2.0. George Hotz, driven by trying to unravel the complexities of neural networks, crafted TinyGrad during his after work hours while simultaneously running the development of Comma AI. Originating as a personal endeavor, TinyGrad transformed into something significant, a powerful deep learning library. Presently, it stands as a crucial tool in the realm of inference space, giving users a streamlined and efficient platform for delving in deep learning. Leveraging George's profound comprehension of software and hardware integration, the project has expanded in functionality and has generated more than 12,000 stars on GitHub. Despite processing robust hardware capabilities, Advanced Micro Devices Incorporated AMD, has faced challenges in establishing a significant presence in the machine learning landscape. The primary cause of its struggles appears to be less related to hardware capabilities and more associated with deficiencies in its software. AMD's open source software platform, ROCM, was designed to seamlessly integrate with popular ML frameworks like PyTorch, has encountered its share of obstacles. User experiences indicate that the software doesn't consistently build without issues, is prone to segmentation faults, and occasionally yields incorrect results. In essence, despite the potential of AMD's hardware, the prevailing software issues have substantially hindered its adoption in the ML domain. With these problems in mind, Pot's latest venture, the TinyCorp, which was established just before his stint at Twitter on November 5th, 2020, introduces a distinctive approach to overcoming these challenges. The company's primary objective is to commoditize the pay to flop, essentially making high performance computing more accessible and cost effective. Acknowledging the potential monopolization of the future of AI by entities controlling a significant portion of the world's computing power, the TinyCorp is committed to preventing this by democratizing access to potent computing resources, a key asset of the TinyCorp is tiny grad. Notably, it sidesteps the complexities associated with UCDA or similar platforms that could introduce unpredictable behavior. The tiny corp strategy for addressing AMD software challenges is direct. Sidestep existing software capabilities and create their own. Leveraging the comprehensive documentation of AMD's RDNA 3 instruction set, the company intends to construct a more effective software stack the approach is designed to position AMD more prominently in the machine learning landscape. The company's immediate objective is to have AMD featured on MLPerf, a recurring competition involving the training of a set of standard ML models using the TinyGrad framework. The TinyCorp holds the potential to redefine the terrain of AI and ML computing. This strategy involves manufacturing and selling computers with a goal to challenge the market dominance enjoyed by companies like NVIDIA. With George Hodge's proven track record and TinyCorp's distinctive approach, the trajectory of AI and ML computing could be on the brink of a captivating transformation. On May 24, 2023, TinyCorp announced a successful fundraising round of $5.1 million. The funds will be utilized to manufacture computers tailored for machine learning purposes and develop a neural network framework. The framework was TinyGrad. In addition to these endeavors, TinyCorp designed the TinyBox, an AI computer priced at $15,000. Thank you for watching. Remember to check out Course Careers with the link down below for your free introduction course and to start your career in IT. All information I use for this video will be linked in the description. And if you made it this far in the video, please consider subscribing and watch another video on screen if you're interested.